Okay, so um, Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number five in that series. Uh, title of this lesson, David and Abigail. And uh, we're in 1 Samuel. The story of David and Abigail is in 1 Samuel chapter 25. You can go to that particular uh, part of the Bible. So this particular lesson, David and Abigail, this is the second lesson in the section that looks at the life of King David. Last time we did David and Goliath when he was very young at the beginning of his reign. And now we move forward to a time when he's been king for a while. And as I mentioned, this, uh, this entire uh, series is examining various kings in the Bible to not only familiarize ourselves with key events and people you know, in their lives and in their rule, but also uh, to learn something about our own lives from studying their life. That's why the, the title is you know, lessons, The Lessons Are For Us from the Kings. So today we're going to look at King David's relationship with Abigail not only to learn more about him, but also to examine a brief but important episode in her life that so clearly demonstrates much of what is pleasing to God, not only in a woman, but in any person who claims to be um, a believer. So uh, Abigail's story, as I say, is neatly laid out in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 25. So let's start reading there, shall we? It says, then Samuel died, and all Israel gathered together and mourned for him, and buried uh, him at his house in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now there was a man in Maon whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich, and he had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and it came about while he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the man's name was Nabal, and his wife's name was Abigail. And the woman was intelligent and beautiful in appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his dealing, and he was a Calebite. He was a Calebite. So the first verses, they kind of situate us, if you wish, as far as time is concerned. Uh, David has been anointed as king and heir to Saul's throne because God was displeased with Saul's disobedient attitude and spirit. And during this time, of course, we realize that Saul still reigns, he's still on the throne, he still reigns uh, the, the land, and uh, he's insanely jealous of David and, um, and of course, um, his favor from God and the people. So he doesn't like David because David is popular with the people and he's a righteous man and of course Saul feels threatened. Now we know that Saul continually seeks to kill David thinking that this will preserve his hold on power. And as a result, David is forced to stay on the run with his band of volunteers. You know, they're dodging Saul's troops, they're hiding out. David and his men, uh, we learn from this episode here, survive in the countryside. I mean, you have to feed these people. You know, he's got an army, but they have, to, they have to eat. They need resources and supplies. So they survive in the countryside by providing protection to small villages against foreign raiders and thieves. They're like an unofficial police force that, that care for the, you know, the people that live not in the city but in the countryside. And in return for this protection, he has provided food and supplies as well as a, a network of informers who protect him from the king and his many efforts at capturing him. This is how he's surviving. So this is the situation as Samuel, the prophet and judge who anointed both Saul and David, dies, and David, feeling the loss, heads out into the desert to hide from Saul and to plot his next move. All right, so let's keep going with the story. That David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. So David sent 10 young men, and David said to the young men, go up to Carmel, visit Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say, have a long life, peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Now your shepherds have been with us, and we have not insulted them, nor have they missed anything all the days they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we have come on a festive day. Please give whatever you find at hand to your servants, and to your son David. So we see David approach this rich businessman for a share of the profits made possible 
because of the protection that he afforded his employees as they worked you know, in the fields with the animals. Now realize this was not any type of extortion. There was no threat here. I mean, without David's protection, this man would have lost men and animals to thieves and raiding parties. So David was providing a very true service to not only him, but others. He simply came to claim a share of the profits and to celebrate with the others on a, on a good and profitable day. You know, time, time, to, time to share the wealth, so to speak. So we read in verse nine, when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in David's name. Then they waited. But Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David and who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants today who are each breaking away from uh, his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men whose origin I do not know? So David's young men retracted their way and went back, and they came and told him according to all these words. David said to his men, each of you gird on his sword. So each man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men went up behind David while 200 stayed with the baggage. Also gives you an idea of how many men he had, 600 people plus you know, wives and children. You know, it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big organization here. So I want you to note in this passage the insult in Nabal's response to David's request. He doesn't plead poverty. He doesn't say, wow, man, you know, things are tight. I've got bills. I don't have a lot to share. He doesn't plead poverty. He knows who David is. He, he says the son of Jesse. So he knows who David is and he knows his position. But he refuses to acknowledge David's anointing by the Lord. That's the first insult. He says that David is nothing more than a runaway slave, not the future king of Israel. You know the way he says it? Well, there, there are a lot of slaves running away from their masters these days. It's like an epidemic. You know? you're, you're one of those guys. So Nabal even dismisses David's efforts to help him and refuses to give him any food, any reward, to which he, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's deserved. So David's men return and tell David of this insult. So right away, right, you know, David straps on his sword and prepares his men to go and destroy Nabal and his entire household. PowerPoint 10, I want you to notice something. Note here that there is cause for David to be angry because he's been insulted. But killing everybody in Nabal's house, that's not justified. That, that's not justified. I mean, uh, Nabal, and that's the way you pronounce his name, you know, Nabal. I mean, he was a jerk, you know, we'd say today, but that's not a capital offense. You know, being a, if, if, if being a jerk was a capital offense, there'd be a lot of dead people around, you know what I'm saying? So, and in doing this, uh, this thing, David's work in helping and protecting the people, at this point, it will turn into extortion. You know, if you don't pay me, I'll kill you. So that would certainly ruin the relationship he has with the people. So we keep reading verse 14. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he scorned them. Yet the men were very good to us, and we were not insulted, nor did we miss anything as long as we went about with them while we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day. All the time we were with them, tending the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you should do, for evil is plotted against our master and against all his household, and he is such a worthless man that no one can uh, speak to him. Then Abigail hurried and took 200 loaves of bread and two jugs of wine and five sheep already prepared and five measures of roasted grain and 100 clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and loaded them on donkeys. She said to her young men, go on before me, behold, I am coming after you but she did not tell her husband Nabal. It came about as she was riding on her donkey and coming down by the hidden part of the mountain that behold, David and his men were coming down toward her, so she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain I have guarded all that this man has in the wilderness so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him and he has returned me evil for good. May God do, uh, may God do so to the enemies of David and more also if by morning I leave as much as one male of any who belonged to him. 
So the writer now focuses on uh, Nabal's, Nabal, uh, Nabal's wife as she, she finds out what her husband has done and she tries to save him, her household, and herself. I want you to note how the writer explains that David's request was just and Nabal's response quite rude and quite ungrateful. So Abigail sends a large provision of food, which Nabal should have sent, and prepares to go to David to plead their case in person. Notice also a little further back how self-righteous David feels. He's about to go to somebody's house and wipe out the entire household, kill everybody in sight, and saying, boy, you know, and, and do so with some righteous indignation, you know, that God's on his side. That's what his mindset is. Uh, verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she hurried and dismounted from her donkey and fell on her face before David and bowed herself to the ground. Note how she greets him with great respect. Respect reserved for a king. You know, Nabal didn't treat him as a king. Nabal said, you know, this guy's a runaway slave. But she, she understood who he was and treated him with the, with the proper respect. Verse 24, it says, she fell at his feet and said, on me alone, my Lord, be the blame. And please let your maidservant speak to you and listen to the words of your maidservant. Please do not let my Lord pay attention to this worthless man, Nabal. For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. So I want you to note also how she takes the blame for the negligence and insult towards David and, and his people. It's my fault, she says. By taking responsibility, she now makes David deal with her instead of dealing with her husband. Now, this was not manipulative on her part. I mean, some of the blame did lie with her. She could have made the gift in advance. She knew who David was. She knew what he was doing. She could have sent supplies you know, throughout the season. She knew it was the end of the season. She could have done something, you know, be a little more proactive. She had the power to do it. So she either was not informed of David's work or had overlooked the payment. Either way, she's here now. She takes the blame now. She's ready to make things right now. And she's ready for the consequences now. All right, verse 26. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has restrained you from shedding blood and from avenging yourself by your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek evil against my Lord be as Nabal. Now let this gift which your maidservant has brought to my Lord be given to the young men who accompany my Lord. So Abigail shows both her uh, uh, submissiveness and her intelligence as she puts the issue into perspective for David. She appeals to him not to take his own revenge. This would be wrong. What her husband did was wrong, she admits it, but taking revenge would make two wrongs. She says in effect, Nabal is so evil, he's not worth it. Why are you doing this? He's, he's not worth the effort. Allow the gift that I have brought to you to cover the offense. Verse 28, 29. Please forgive the transgression of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord is fighting the battles of the Lord, and evil will not be found in all your days. Should anyone rise up to pursue you and to seek your life, then the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. But the lives of your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. So unlike her husband, she recognizes his anointing as king and she praises his future rule. My husband doesn't, he thinks you're just a runaway slave, she says, but I believe you are the future king. She also acknowledges her loyalty and belief in him, unlike her husband who followed Saul. See, that's the idea. Her husband was a, you know, he sympathized with Saul, who was on the throne, not with David. I want you to also note um, uh, the, um, 
the use of imagery of a sling. You know, she talks about, she says, your enemies he will sling out as from the hollow of a sling. Does that kind of bring up an image there? You know, she, she's, she's a smart woman. She says, boy, you're going to do to your enemies as, as a sling, you know, like a slingshot. Well, what did he do? What brought him to prominence? Well, he used a slingshot to kill Goliath. So she kind of, you know, she goes back into history and brings back that image of his first great triumph. And she says, in the future, you're going to take care of your enemies in the same way that you took care of, of Goliath. Very smart, very, very smart thing to, uh, to say. So this was, this is, you know, she also puts her finger on really what the issue is. Her husband was a follower of Saul. He was sympathetic to Saul's reign. He wanted Saul to remain in power. He didn't believe that David was the true successor. She, on the other hand, believed that David was the true successor to the throne, and she treated him in that manner. All right, verse 30 and 31. And when the Lord does for my Lord according to all the good that He has spoken concerning you and appoints you ruler over Israel, this will not cause grief or a troubled heart to my Lord, both by having shed blood without cause and by my Lord having avenged Himself. When the Lord deals well with my Lord, then remember your maid servant. So here Abigail makes her second appeal, this time based on David's future rulership. Her first appeal is, look, let the gift that I've given you cover the offense. My husband's not worth it. Second appeal, okay? She points out that when he does ascend to the throne, it shouldn't be with innocent blood on his hands. She also asks him to remember her when all of this come about. So her second argument is, you don't really want to ascend to the throne and be the king which you are going to be, which the Lord has given you, and have innocent blood on your hands? You don't really want that, do you? Verse 32. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me, and blessed be your discernment, and blessed be you who have kept me this day from bloodshed and from avenging myself by my own hand. Nevertheless, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has restrained me from harming you, unless you had come quickly to meet me, surely there would not have been left to Nabal until the morning light as much as one male. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, go, go up to your house in peace. See, I have listened to you and granted your request. Oh, I love this story, so good. Have you ever dodged a bullet by listening to a friend's advice? I mean, you don't marry the person you wanted to marry and maybe your parents were saying, you know, I don't think he's right for you or she's right for you. And in a moment of wisdom, you kind of listened to your parents and kind of stood back a little bit, you know, and then a few, dear, a few years down the road, you, you really meet the one, you know, and you go, wow. Whew. Or maybe someone says, I wouldn't invest money in that stock if I were you. I know it looks like a sure thing, but you know, I wouldn't put, you know. Or don't buy that car, you know. You read the reports and you go, maybe I shouldn't buy that fancy car that I really like, but, and find out that it's, you know, you dodge a bullet. And when you do, the relief and the joy you feel when the advice turns out to be true. Well, this is how David feels. And this is how he reacts when he realizes that he could have wrecked his entire future with this one rash act provoked by a fool. A fool provoked him into doing something he would have regretted all of his, uh, all of his life. And so David acknowledges that she is sent by God. He is amazed, he's delighted, he's relieved, he's merciful. Verse 36, then Abigail came to Nabal and behold, he was holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him for he was very drunk. So she did not tell him anything at all until the morning light. But in the morning when the wine had gone out of Nabal, his wife told him these things and his heart died within him so that he became as a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. So as it is written, you know, revenge is mine, saith the Lord, Deuteronomy 32, 35. And so it is with Nabal. 
as he dies from a heart attack after a drunken party and the shock that she spent all this money <laughs> to, to give someone that he didn't like, an enemy of his, you know, all, that, all those resources. It wasn't that he was a fool, it was that he treated God's servants badly. That's always dangerous. And you know what? It's always dangerous then and it's always dangerous now. Not a good thing to treat a child of God in a bad way. Because no matter how badly you've been treated as a child of God, nothing compared to how the person who harmed you is going to be treated. When the Lord says, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's why you pray for your enemy, because you know God and you know the, it's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God. So you pray for your enemy because your enemy doesn't realize what they have just done in hurting you, in harming you. Because the pain you feel, okay, because of the harm or the offense or whatever, is nothing compared to the pain they're going to feel down the line. That's why we pray for our enemies. 39 to 42. When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept back his servant from evil. The Lord has also returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. Then David sent a proposal to Abigail to take her as his wife. When the servants of David came to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her saying, David has sent us to you to take you as his wife. She arose and bowed with her face to the ground and said, Behold, your maidservant is a maid to wash the feet of my Lord's servants. Then Abigail quickly arose and rode on a donkey with her five maidens who attended her, and she followed the messengers of David, and she became his wife. So David rejoices that God has avenged him and that he's been spared making a terrible mistake. His offer of marriage to a rich widow, because you know, she, she inherits everything. So his offer of marriage to a rich widow solves his food and supply problem and guarantees that he won't be put in that position again. It's a very practical thing, you know, but he's got 600 plus mouths to feed. And then in, in, in one day, boom, he inherits you know, all of this food making apparatus. Controlled, controlled and managed by whom? by Abigail, his wife. Note how beautifully Abigail answers his proposal with confidence and submission, true to her nature as a noble woman of her time. Now she was David's second wife and with her he had one son named Chiliab or in some places they, they called him Daniel. I love this story. I, this is such a wonderful story. A wonderful story on many levels, but I think it especially develops the character of what a godly woman can aspire to be. When we look at Abigail in this passage, we see several characteristics that are quite appealing in a woman, aside from her great beauty. Because the Bible says she was intelligent and quite beautiful. Very rare that the Bible actually comments on a person's appearance, very, very rare. So she must have been exceptionally beautiful for the Bible to actually mention it. Okay? And there's a, a purpose for that as well, I believe. So what about Abigail? What was she? Well, first of all, she was decisive. Once she knew the problem, she made a decision and she set her entire household into action to you know, take care of the problem. She was brave. She didn't know what to expect when she met David. I mean, he could have just killed her right there on the road. Wait a minute, you're, you're with that Nabal, somebody. He had killed women before. When he had to go in and wipe out a village, he, you know, they killed the men, the women, the children, everybody. They wiped everybody out. So it wasn't his, you know, oh, I could never kill a woman. No, no, he had killed women before. I mean, think about the situation. She's coming from Carmel, he's going up, and they come around the, the mountain, and then boom, they're face to face. One woman, 400 men. One woman, 400 men. 
You know, from her you learn that bravery is facing your fear instead of running away from your fear. That's what bravery is. Number three, she was wise. Without being dishonest or manipulative, she showed that she could respond to a foolish husband or a future king, either one. She could handle a foolish husband, she could handle a future king. She was diplomatic. Her approach and attitude toward David was respectful without being you know, syrupy or cloying. She talked to a king with confidence and even a little bit of aggressiveness. She was pure. Abigail did not depend on her sex appeal or her beauty to win David over. She didn't kind of bat her eyes at him. She didn't make any type of promises like that. She remained faithful to her husband even if he was insufferable. Number six, she was insightful. Notice how she put her finger on the real danger right away. The real danger wasn't that she would be killed or her foolish husband. The real danger was that David would wreck his reign doing this foolish thing. I mean, the disaster awaiting was David's potential sin in taking his own revenge. She made him see this despite his hurt, pride, and anger. She was honest. She was honest with both David and her husband. She acknowledged her husband's fault and her responsibility with David. She also told her husband the truth about what she had done. I mean, a guy with so much food, so, much, you know, so many resources wouldn't, wouldn't miss it. She didn't, she didn't try to hide it from him. She was wise. She didn't tell him while he was drunk. This is not a good, you ever try to reason with somebody who's drunk? Not a good thing. She waited till the next day, till he had sobered up. She told him exactly what she did and probably why she did it. Both of the situations, facing David, facing her husband, involved quite a risk for this woman. And yet she, she took those risks. Her honesty was her shield. She was being honest. She was also humble. Her attitude was filled with meekness and submissiveness with both men, with both David and Nabal. Note how none of her other qualities are diminished in any way by her humility. As a matter of fact, her other virtues are heightened when seen alongside of her submissiveness. Such a dirty word in this day and age. You know. Not just you know, a, a wife being submission to her husband, but anybody being submission to anybody else. You know, it's like a dirty word. You know. Nobody wants to obey any laws. Nobody wants to obey any customs. Nobody wants to obey any propriety, what is proper in certain situations. You know. All that's gone out the window these days. So she was able to demonstrate her humble spirit without sacrificing her intelligence and, and her honesty and her wisdom and so on and so forth. I, I think that's just fantastic. She was also patient. Let's face it, she was married to an evil bore of a man. She had no children. She could have cried, she could have left, she could have conspired to have him killed. Think about that for a minute. Her deal with David could have been, look, I, I'm bringing the food and I'm you know, providing this, you know, so please spare my life. But if you want to go ahead and kill this guy, hey, you'll be doing both of us a favor. <laughs> but no, she pleaded for the life of her husband. She could have pleaded for her own life, but didn't. She didn't excuse her husband but she worked with what she had, patiently waiting upon the Lord. In another lesson, remember I told you, probably the hardest single uh, Christian discipline to learn is waiting upon the Lord. It's the most difficult thing to learn to do as a Christian, to wait upon the Lord. But she waited upon the Lord. And number 10, she was truly a spiritual person, not just a spiritual woman, she was a spiritual person. Anybody who was spiritual, could be male or female, could use her as an example. 
Her appeal to David was based on scripture in Deuteronomy 32, 35, right? Revenge is mine, saith the Lord. She appealed to him with scripture. Her encouragement to David was an acknowledgement of God's choice of David as king, something her husband could not see, but she recognized. She knew the word, she knew the Lord, she knew the Lord's anointed, and she was a willing servant of all three. Now I want you to note that Abigail's beauty was not listed as one of her qualities in my observation of her, right? I've looked at the passage and I've, made, I've compiled 10 qualities, there are more probably if you go back over it, but I've compiled 10 qualities that I see in this woman. Notice that not a one of them has anything to do with what she looked like. You know, so many women today are pushed you know, to focus a lot of their effort and attention on beauty rather than the things that Abigail possessed which surpassed her beauty and make her beauty a non-issue. It was a non-issue. You see, Abigail's beauty did not factor into um, what saved her life and the life of her household. It wasn't because she was beautiful that David saved her and her household. It was not what drew her to David. In praising her, David never mentions her beauty. In the book of Samuel, it says, Abigail was intelligent and beautiful, but that's not what David is saying. David never ever refers, in any of the dialogue, he never refers to her looks. And it wasn't beauty that made her a useful and pleasing servant of God. As a matter of fact, how beautiful we are or not does not impress God at all, <laughs> period. It has zero impression factor with God. How good looking we happen to be or not to be, zero. Why? He's given us the nose we got, the eyes we've got, the ears, you know, he's given us that. So you know, we got to work with what he's given us. We can't impress him. So let's take a couple of, uh, let's take a look at a couple of lessons now. Remember, lessons from the king. So let's, this, this is lessons from the kings, but somebody associated with the king. You know. Lessons from Abigail. Lesson number one. God can use you no matter who you're married to. Abigail had an unhappy marriage, but her goal was not how to have a good marriage or how do I get out of my marriage. Her goal was how do I serve the Lord despite the marriage that I'm in? And a lot of people think only about the marriage and how to solve the, quote, problem in their marriage. They go to counseling to learn how to change, uh, you know, how do I change my mate? Or how do I get out without feeling guilty? Or how do I find a new partner? If people concentrated more on how they could personally be more focused and devoted to the Lord in love and in service, this would help their existing marriage, believe it or not. And this would help single people get their priorities straight before they marry. And this would prepare unmarried people to succeed in subsequent marriages. You know, a lot of people in our congregation you know, are in subsequent marriages, meaning they're in a second marriage, some even in a third marriage. The, the problem that I have is a lot of times people don't learn anything from the failure of their first marriage. I mean, you know, we fail at stuff. We fail at marriage, that's okay. That's why Jesus died on the cross, to forgive us for our sins, including failing at marriage. The problem is many times we don't learn anything from that. And all the mistakes and all the baggage in that first relationship, we drag it into the second one and make the same mistakes all over again. I mean, what good is finding a new partner for a few years if you lose your spiritual focus and even your soul? So the lesson that Abigail teaches us is that it is possible to be focused on God and faithful in His service and growing spiritually while being in not a great marriage. Not using our less than perfect marriage as an excuse to not serve the Lord, 
as an excuse not to grow in Christ, as an excuse not to grow in service. Because she was in a bad marriage. But look at what she did despite that. Another lesson from Abigail. God's woman can function in any situation. In those times, women were not formally educated. They had no legal rights, no social position. Despite these obstacles, look at what Abigail was and look at what she did. Her devotion to God and knowledge of His word enabled her to deal with a complex negotiation and become an inspiration to generations after her. I mean, listen, what man would not want to have this kind of woman as a wife? And what corporation would not want to hire this person today? And what home would not benefit from such a person as a mother and a wife? Modern society, you know, they put down homemakers or religious women as marginal, you know, they have no impact, they have no influence. But God's woman, she has the spirit of God to strengthen her. She has the word of God to guide her. She has the promise of God to encourage her. She has the family of God to surround her. And so God's woman can function dynamically in every situation, whether it be in the home or in the outside world. No matter where, the, uh, where she is, she's always God's woman. Whether she's the CEO of a corporation or the CEO of the home, she's still God's woman. She's still you know, bringing into play all of the qualifications that God's woman has. And then a third and final lesson from Abigail. Abigail's beauty was a bonus. Yes, she was beautiful, but this is not what saved the day. And this is not what inspired and impressed David. And this is not why her story is in the Bible. We are always first impressed by beauty. We easily focus on beauty. But in the long run, we find out that beauty does not accomplish anything. Beauty does not produce anything. Abigail saved her family. She saved her soul. She saved the future king's integrity because she was wise and insightful and humble and so on and so forth, not because she was beautiful. You see, we remember beauty, we remember it, but we don't admire it. A person's beauty has no power to inspire us. It only has power to attract us, but not inspire us. So Abigail shows women how to deal successfully with men without relying exclusively on outward beauty. And I think that's a marvelous lesson that she teaches us. In the end, David married a beautiful woman, but he didn't marry her just because she was beautiful. He also married her because she was God's woman. All right, so lessons from the kings and especially a, a woman who figured very prominently in the life of King David. We're going to continue our series uh, next week. Thank you for your attention.